Regarding Men, Episode 5, The Green New Deal. Okay. Hello, everyone. Here we are again after a week's hiatus due to circumstances beyond Paul Elam's control. I'm Janice Fiamingo. I'm here with Tom Golden and Paul Elam, and we are talking about news and how it affects men. And we're going to look at two subjects today, one of which is maybe getting a little bit old, but we wanted to still discuss it, and it is the New Green Deal that was introduced on Thursday, February the 7th by Democratic Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I think she had support um, uh, from a, a Massachusetts senator, I wrote his name down, Ed Markey as well. And so they unveiled their new Green Deal. And of course, as everybody knows, this is an outline of massive legislation that the two hope will tackle climate change change and really essentially entirely reorder the American economy as well as bring justice to the oppressed. Uh, they're explicitly modeling it after uh, Res uh, President uh, Roosevelt's New Deal that was introduced during the Great Depression and of course that's still being deba debated by economists whether that actually helped the economy to recover or not. Um, the New Deal, the Green New Deal is extremely ambitious, of course. It sets as its target that it will reduce greenhouse emissions by 40 to 60 percent by 2030, which of course is only a decade away, and will entirely reduce down to zero uh, by, by 2050. Its main plank, of course, would be the um, massive reduction or entire elimination of the United States' reliance on um, dirty sources of energy, uh, particularly coal and oil and gas, and uh, the introduction of clean energy. They, they don't include um, nuclear energy in that, so they're talking about getting all sources of energy from uh, solar and wind power, so, which, of course, as we know, may one day be affordable and practical, but certainly are not now or in the foreseeable future. But they're also, of course, promoting justice and equity and this has had a lot of support 60 members of the house and nine senators have co-sponsored uh, the resolution including interestingly enough all of the presidential hopefuls so although we know that this is going to be dead in the water when it gets to the uh, republican controlled senate this is looking like a, a blueprint for the the future according to to the democrats so we want to talk about what that is going to mean if, if, it, if that is the wave of the future um, by Democrat politicians. What is that going to mean particularly for men? And then once we've had a chance to talk about this a little bit, we also want to talk about what's been going on in Virginia lately, especially with the allegations of sexual assault against the uh, Virginia Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, who's been accused by two women now and has been called up upon by all members of his party, both at the national, national and the state level, uh, to resign based on these allegations, and who just in the last day uh, made a public statement in which he linked the um, uh, credulity, the willingness to believe, the willingness to allow these two women's um, un unsubstantiated allegations to derail his career uh, with, with lynching itself. And he's been much criticized for playing the race card and evoking lynching, but we want to talk a little bit about um, the, the ways in which, in fact, what he is, is experiencing and what many men in politics and, and other areas of public life are experiencing as a kind of um, modern day version of lynching. So that's what we're going to do. So um, who wants to go first? Do, should I say something about it? Or? One thing, Janice, and that is that whatever you're paying for now, it's going to be free when this comes out. <laughs> oh yes, right. Mm -hmm. Everything is going to be free. Yeah. And everyone gets a union job that will pay for their household and, and everyone gets free college and free medical care. What do you mean a job? You don't have to work. If That's you don't the other you. part, Paul. Mm -hmm. You don't have to work. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Yeah. How, how all of this is going to be paid for is um, uh, an amazing an amazing pie in the sky kind of fantasy. It, it, uh, well, it, when you look at it, though, it is, I mean, for me, it's just further illustration of how bizarre 
the left's thinking has become yes. and how much of it's been adopted by mainstream mm -hmm. Democrats. Uh, it, it's, it's almost like they're afraid of AOC. But even without the Green Deal, for instance, we have the left pushing a policy of simultaneously open borders and a welfare state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you come up with the math that where any sane person, and I'm, I'm talking about anybody with an IQ over about 15, <laughs> anybody come up with the e economic viability of open borders and a welfare state. Uh, I mean, we think we're seeing caravans now. Uh, yeah. We're not seeing anything. I mean, if the, if the left gets their way uh, about what's going on with the borders, uh, that alone will bankrupt us. But with the new Green Deal, we're talking about something that has an estimated price tag of $93 trillion. Um, which I don't know where we're going to get that, um, much less the money to pay people for not working. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I'll tell you, and I won't mention names because it's personal. I talked to a very confirmed leftist this last week. Matter of fact, engaged in several lengthy conversations. And this is somebody who owns a company who is quite, he's mid thirties, quite brilliant, actually. Uh, one of the smartest people I know. But his, one, he believed fully that solar power was efficient enough to power everything, which we know that is just flat not true. And so his theory was, is that if we just took over like Arizona and New Mexico, and covered those land masses with solar panels, we can power the entire nation. Now, this is, I'm, I'm not kidding. And this is, you know, come, coming from somebody that I care about, a, a, and a truly a brilliant person. But the level of delusion. Yeah, it's crazy. This thinking is just and there was no reasoning. There was no, explain to me how this works. Yeah. You know, when even the manufacturers of solar panels are saying we're not there yet. And it's worse than that. You know, the whole thing reminds me of a Saturday morning cartoon, you know, like the Roadrunner. It's like, it's just so bizarre. It's so crazy. But I heard someone had, had done the math and they found that it was going to take the land mass equal to California and Texas in order to produce the, the electricity needed. I mean, that's, that's the kind of nuttiness we're talking about. You know, it's not going to be Arizona and New Mexico. It's going to be California and Texas. That's a lot of land, you know? Oh, yeah. And meanwhile, the cost of even with government credits, which we have in the United States, we have tax credits yeah. for powering homes with solar power. Mm -hmm. The cost after tax credit for 10 uh, 10 kilowatts worth of power to an individual home is $21,000. Multiply that by the land mass of Texas and California and think of what kind of numbers we're actually talking yeah. about here. It's cartoonish. Yeah. Um, Just absolutely, you know, it's can't, it, can't add up. And and, lots and of other not to mention, I mean, no air travel, no beef, yeah. No, yeah. beef, please. <laughs> so, no, that's not going to yeah. work. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that fascinated me about this whole thing is that if you read the actual resolution, you get a bit of a different spin on this. You know, I, I was confused at the beginning because this car, the cows farting stuff, is like, that's not in the resolution itself. And I've heard people say, oh, that's just the conservatives trying to, you know, throw blah, blah, blah. Actually not. Where that comes from was Alexandria Cortez put out what's called a fact sheet. And it was the fact sheet that had all these zany things in it, like the mm. farting cows and this is and that's, and that's where they've drawn all this stuff from. You know, the unwilling to work piece. 
It was from her yes. fact sheet that she published. Which you mean the fact me. sheet that she removed once they noticed there was a lot of something non Something like that. But how could you be so dumb to publish something like that? I mean, the only thing that, that strikes me as a possibility is that this was done as a decoy. The whole thing with this Green New Deal was done as a way to bring the news up to such a level that no one notices the other stuff that's going on, like McCabe trying to topple the government. You know, it's, it's like, oh, well, that's nothing. Look at what happened with the Green New Deal. It's like, oh, God, it's crazy. It is crazy, but I don't think it is just a distraction. I really uh, do think that, um, I mean, it, it, it continues to astound me that so many highly intelligent people, and I actually don't really think that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is, is stupid. Um, you know, she's quite glib in many ways, and yes. um, you know, she speaks quite well, um, but, you know, she is educated in leftist thinking, and it's obviously the case that many highly intelligent people can believe that this kind of mass restructuring of the economy is possible. Yeah. We've seen it happen. I mean, that, the history of the 20th century and all of the horrors therein and the continuing dream that the communist you know, manifesto can be somehow realized is, is evidence of that. These are not stupid people. Right. They're not even malevolent right. people. Uh, you know, they, they are simply possessed of uh, you know, a, a, an ideology that, that derails rationalism in some way or de derails um, pragmatism uh, yeah. and, and that makes any sacrifice seem worth it, any sacrifice of people uh, seem worth it for the, the higher goal of, 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 you know, their idea of economic and, of course, ecological justice. And I think that, and that was one of the points that I wanted to make was, of course, you know, uh, on the literal level in terms of the impact on men, and I, I read an article saying that, that you can see this new Green Deal as a kind of blow, a, a striking a blow of revenge against those mostly white working class men who overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump. And in some way, although I don't think consciously um, necessarily, this is a statement that it's all out war on the part of the, you know, the young, fervent socialist members of the Democratic Party against that white working class man. Huh. And because, of course, this will decimate the, obviously, the, you know, it will involve a massive restructuring of the automobile industry, of the aeronautics industry, a total decimation of the coal, of the oil and gas, you know, most of which overwhelmingly employ men. Um, and so, so those men are seen as, as um, needing to, to pay the price. And, uh, and what, what struck me as I was thinking about all of this was that even if the goal of this um, new Green Deal is not particularly to hurt men, at, at its foundations, the whole idea of ecological justice comes straight out of feminism. Right. And it's, it's, its core priorities are anti-male, its core assumptions mm -hmm are anti-male at the deepest level. And so anybody who, any man uh, who is sort of interested in environmental, you know, in environmentalism, as you know, we all are, obviously, we wanna live on a healthy planet and, and we want uh, everybody to do well and, and uh, we want resources to be used responsibly. But anybody who is interested in these things should look at the feminist origins of environmentalism. There's a whole branch of feminism yes. called ecofeminism. It started in the 1970s. Um, Mary Daly, Gein slash ecology, uh, Susan Griffin, women in nature, uh, Carolyn Merchant, uh, another major um, feminist uh, environmentalist. It, it really took off in the 1980s and 1990s. And it, it, it sees that the supposedly the domination of women by men has both structural and ideological parallels with the domination of nature by men. Right. It's specifically opposed to resource extraction, which it seems that sees as a kind of paradigm. Rape. Or, yeah, exactly. And it literally, they yeah. use those terms, the yep. rape of the earth, the, yep. the domination, the subjugation of the earth, just as women are dominated and subjugated. Men seek to control, you know, the resources of the earth just as they seek to control women and children. So all, all the things that men have done to make the earth habitable 
to make it possible for us to do more than simply, you know, eke out a bare living day to day are actually seen as violence against the earth. Therefore, the whole thrust of the ideology, to use the word thrust, of course, is in some way patriarchal and phallogocentric, uh, the whole thrust of it is, is anti-male. And if that means that we destroy civilization in order to save the planet, remember there was that book a few years ago called The World Without Us? Um, I forget the author. It, it was all about what the earth would look like if human beings just magically disappeared. And it was, and many, many people wrote about how they were so comforted by reading this book to imagine, isn't it wonderful that the earth will go on without us and the plants will come back and all these, you know, the ecosystem will come back. Yeah, but we won't be there to, to appreciate it or, you know, to revel in the, in the beauty of it, but that's okay. You know, so there is this deeply actually anti-human impetus yes. that's, that's also part of this whole new green deal, despite what it says about social justice and everything else. So, um, so, it, so anybody interested in, in all of these things should definitely look into eco-feminism. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, uh, I, I've got something to add to that. Too. First, I want to back up for a moment and go back to AOC in the matter of her presumed intelligence. I, <laughs> I agree with you, Janice. I don't think she's unintelligent. I don't think she's stupid at all. She was smart enough to know that if she banged on enough doors, for an election with the right message that she would probably win pretty handily. And she was smart enough to do that. But also, you know, that she said things like she was looking forward to being inaugurated. <laughs> uh, yeah. They don't just inaugurate. Just a matter of language. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She you're said, being so bail, you know, you're yes, so, so I am. concerned and about she these was details. Looking forward to signing legislation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she was looking forward to all sorts of things that are not going to happen because she doesn't even understand fundamental civics yes. when it mm -hmm. comes to Correct. American yeah. politics. She's the uh, boss. And, and that is the same ignorance that I see, the same kind of ignorance that I see reflected in the support for things like the New Green Deal, this sort of la, 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 oh yeah, we're going to sign a bill and in 10 years we'll, we'll save the earth. I just want to bring up one sort of <laughs> interesting, maybe interesting uh, thought about consumerism and the environment and ecofeminism, uh, which Janice just discussed. I think, I wonder if you compare consumerism related to environmental damage and who spends liquidable income in all of our cultures, uh, how many malls are filled with SUVs, uh, with soccer moms uh, shopping in them, how much animal testing is done for makeup products and things like that. When I start digging in and looking at consumer habits, what I see is more of a female problem than a male problem with how our consumer identity and our consumer habits impact the environment. And I'm with everybody else in this discussion. I would love to live. I want clean air, uh, clean water. I would love to, to live on a, on a healthy planet. Um, but I, I feel compelled. It's important to point out that every time you see a film, these old 70s films of men out on the ice clubbing baby seals, uh, to get their fur, that wasn't for men to wear them. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think as a species, we need to own some of that stuff. If we're going to approach the environment in a healthy way, we need to look at what our real priorities are and, you know, where the money and where the pollution is coming from, where is it going to? And so I, just to be contrary, I wanted to throw that in. Mm. No, that's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, feminists will admit, you know, in theory, that in some way women are complicit in these systems of domination, but you'll never get them to admit that they're driving them. Yes. Uh, you know, they always have all sorts of ways to, 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 to weasel out of, of taking full responsibility. You know, they're never active agents in any of it. You know, the other piece of this is that men tend to pay more taxes. 
You know, it's the men who are supplying the money that drives and runs the government, mm -hmm. not the women. Yeah. And so in some ways, this whole, you know, pie in the sky stuff is a tax on men. Of course. You know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Men are going to have to pay for it, though. Yeah. I don't know how men are going to pay for it when they're going to destroy all of the industries that, that men work in. But, yeah, I'd, I'd love yeah. to see the numbers on that. I, I know they did a New Zealand study where they looked at the uh, amount of tax that men paid versus the amount of tax that women paid. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen one for the U.S. If anybody out there knows of one in the U.S., let us know. That would be very I've seen that quoted a few times. I can't give you a direct source, but I've, I've seen several people bring that up and talk about Yes. That you know, actual income tax paid. Uh, yes. I'm just glad that I, I, thankfully, I never have to worry about getting myself into the 70 percentile. <laughs> there, even, even I'm safe from AOC. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. You know, the other thing about the AOC thing is that what's she going to do with the 11 to 14 million people on disability? I mean, <laughs> Probably kill them. <laughs> yeah, really. That's what they did in the uh, Soviet Union, right? Oh, boy. Because that's a lot of folks who are, quote, disabled. Yeah, I wasn't saying that to be cute. Yeah, no, I'm, I heard you. And I, I pretty much agree with what you're saying. You know, if we get to that point. There are some parallels here that are very, very disturbing. Read your salsa needs some. Yes. You know, and you see the parallels. It's frightening. It is frightening. You know, we, including one of the main ones, uh, you know, of the Solzhenitsa in eras, what he wrote about was that if you disagreed with the state, that that was a form of mental illness. Yes. Um, yes. Um, and so that's that was why they, they locked so many people up. That was the pretense for locking up so many people in gulags yeah. because their disagreement with the state and with the political system proved that they were insane. Showed how and crazy. What we have now, we have toxic masculinity. Exactly. Uh, and we have exactly. pathologizing of yes. people on the right as bigoted, hateful, yeah. violent. Yes. When just the opposite is true. When you really look at Antifa and, and you start looking at the left and you're seeing what's happening, um, this is a, I think we're in very dangerous times. I think in so that too. Respect. I agree. I quite agree. So well, nice. shall we shall we move on to uh, to touch on the other topic that we wanted to touch on today? Good, good. Yes. Okay. Fire so, it the up. Other, so the other topic is the uh, and the, these are now not fresh allegations against uh, Lieutenant Governor of Virginia Justin Fairfax, but uh, he has recently been in the news again, denying the allegations and and uh, resisting the. The, uh, the calls to step down that have been coming from everybody in his party. And it is quite striking to me that, um, you know, the, the willingness to, to throw these, you know, a hitherto very promising, much beloved, much respected figures under the bus just because two women happen to have come forward, and not even independently, the, the second, well, let's go back then. So the first allegation was made against him and these are old allegations, as it is so often the case, as he himself pointed out, he's had you know, full FBI checks, uh, background checks, never turned up any of this stuff before, but now um, four weeks ago or so, uh, a, a woman came forward, and this woman's name is Vanessa Tyson, I believe. Um, she claims that in 2004, they were at a Democrat um, national convention, uh, that he forced her to perform sex acts uh, in his hotel room and uh, that she has mentioned this to other... No, I don't think she ever mentioned it. No, it's the other... It's the second accuser that claims she's mentioned it. So so that's one. This woman is a um, political science professor at Stanford University. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> she is, uh, her, essentially, her entire uh, shtick is the intersection of race and gender you know and uh -oh. it's really, you know as a black woman her personal experience uh -oh. of intersecting forms of oppression has been front and center in all of her research more recently her special focus has been the intersection between politics and the me too movement oh. so you know so this is what she lives so she, she alleged that in 2004 this incident occurred justin fairfax denied it 
Then another woman came forward. Her name is Meredith Watson. I don't know what she does, actually, um, and I don't know the details about her allegation. I don't think they're really very public. They don't she, even have a picture of her that they're using yet. That that's I, right. So I, we don't know too much. She, she claims that she came forward because she heard about the other allegation and was so upset to learn that Justin had victimized another woman after he victimized her. Her allegation goes back further to 2000. She claims that he raped her um, or sexually assaulted her uh, in, in 2000 while they were students at Duke University, if I'm remembering correctly. So, so here we have, again, these two allegations claim to be credible by nearly everybody else who's, who's heard of them, although what, you know, what, what it means to say they're credible, I really don't know, except that they're two, two women both saying similar things about this man. <laughs> um, they, they are not sexual assaults um, of, of the sort that anyone would have defined as a sexual assault, you know, even five years ago, I would say. These weren't cases where the women went to police. They weren't, at least we know the one, the, the one in particular, the, the Vanessa Tyson allegation. It wasn't a case where she, you know, screamed no or tried to leave the hotel room or, you know, did anything to indicate that she did not want to participate in, in the sex act. Um, that, you know, she simply claims that um, he, he forced her uh, against her will. I mean, these were both instances, it seems, of, of what we would call non-consensual sex, um, but involving no, no threats, no, no coercion, no violence, anything like that. And of course, they're very, very old allegations, very difficult. I mean, how any of these types of allegations could ever rise to, um, you know, the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, I don't really know. And yet, um, we're supposed to accept what these women are saying as true. And, and it, it's, Seen as reasonable that he should have to step down merely as a result of the allegation. So, you know, he's come forward and said this is a kind of modern day lynching and now the guardians of political correctness and, and, and morally approved thought are saying this is completely unacceptable. And I find it you know, just astounding really that, yes. that yeah. you know, because it is, it, it's outrageous and every man knows, every man who has a political career or wants any kind of public career knows that he's only one allegation or maybe two away from career disaster. I don't know how anybody thinks that a functioning society can carry on on that basis. It's a lot of power. Sure. So it's also important to point out that, that the first woman doing the accusing is being represented by the same law firm that represented Christine Blasey Ford. Hmm. I didn't and know that. That's I wonder if her office is next door to Christine Blasey Ford's. It, 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 it almost seems that way. Uh, you know, I've got to admit when this first came out, hmm. the temptation for a little bit of schadenfreude was there given that this was happening to somebody on the left, that this just wasn't another smear campaign against somebody on the right. Um, but that is not a healthy temptation. Uh, the law in my country says this guy didn't do it. He is presumed innocent. That doesn't mean that we just kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. It means that we presume that he is innocent of these charges and that he must be treated as innocent until there is proof. Yes. And for me, just like Janice was saying, it's one more time, five-year-old allegation, 10, 15-year-old allegation, uh, didn't say anything at the time, no police report, no forensic evidence, no nothing, just somebody's word that he committed a sexual crime. Um, I understand that it, sexual crimes are hard to prove. They're, they're hard to prove when you report them right away. Yes. Uh, but there are at least rape kits, and there's the freshness of testimony, and there's the action of going directly to police or to authorities uh, when something happens. But I just have, no patience and get 
I just can't make myself lend. I, I my skin crawls every time I turn on the news and I hear the words "credible allegation." What does it mean? Yeah. What does it mean, credible? Credible? Why she said it? Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. credible. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I want to see this guy. I hope he continues to stand his ground. Uh, if there is evidence of a crime that he's committed, I hope it's brought to light. Yes. Uh, uh, but until that happens, I want to see him stay in his job and fight this the way he's fighting it, which is to defy it. Amen. Uh, because too many men just throw in the towel and quit because they can't take the heat of yes. something like this. And it's, it's hard, hard man. It's such a powerful weapon. The false accusations are a huge burden. Huge yeah. burden. I mean, it's not not uh, not an easy task. I heard that some of his staff actually resigned because of the allegations. You know, that's like, oh, so much for that. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really is quite astounding. Uh, I should say that, I, um, I should mention that Apparently, the second accuser, Meredith Watson, uh, did tell people about it around the time of the alleged incident. Um, and, you know, that is, is mentioned frequently as, as some kind of confirmation. I, I don't really see that it is. It means no. that, you know, well, I, I don't know what it means. It, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. You know, it... it, it uh, it could mean all sorts of things. Uh, she also uh, is alleged, well, not is alleged, but has a, had a restraining order taken out against her Ooh. by a man in 2008. And the allegations about what she did to him, he claims she held him prisoner in his home at one point, uh, was sending him hundreds of text messages and uh, phone messages threatening him, threatening to destroy him, claiming that she was going to commit suicide, all sorts of things. And obviously that that um, material was brought forward as evidence to obtain this restraining order. So, you know, this is a, a dubious actor, too. What were you and, saying about credible? God. Yeah, yeah. That's bad. Yeah. It started yeah. to, to smell a little bit borderline in the room. Oh. Um, and that's a possibility too, which is why Worse. I don't lend the first accusation any more credence than the second mm. one. Mm. Uh, if somebody is predisposed yes. to lying about a sexual assault, the fact that they told one story so many years yes. ago proves absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. It, it yes. just doesn't take us anywhere. Right. But bless yeah. Fairfax for stepping up and and pointing out that these accusations are in some ways like a lynching, because I think that's right on the money. Yeah, it's the exact words of Clarence Thomas during the Anita Hill hearings. Huh. Yeah. What do you say? He said, this is a high tech lynching. Yeah, that's for, right. For an uppity black that won't conform in thought. And right. it was because he was conservative, but it was it's still the same thing. Right. Same thing. Yeah. 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 And these things are becoming more and more uh, common. I heard just recently about a case, a woman named, I wrote her name down, Nicole Bergen. Have you heard about this case? This was somebody in California. She made a, an accusation last May against somebody who was running uh, to be the state representative, a guy named Phil Graham. She accused him of, um, if you can imagine, forcible kissing which of course is now tantamount to sexual assault. <laughs> I mean, I, I really do have a lot of trouble taking that too seriously, but she accused him of forcible kissing. He lost the election. Uh, he, he was the one that was, he had the endorsement of his party. He looked like he was going to win. He lost. We can't say for sure it was because of that, but it certainly looks like it. So she seriously derailed his career, probably, with this allegation. Then when it went to trial, on the day that the trial was supposed to begin, she retracted her allegation. No. And, and, yeah, and has pled guilty now to making a false charge. Oh. And, and she received 
a, a sentence of two days. She will spend two days in jail. I think. I guess it's a, a suspension. How about two sentence. years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really. Wow. Yeah. So you know, so this is going on now quite regularly. Women are aware that oh. it, this is a weapon that can be used against powerful men. And so to pretend that we have to continue to believe women or that there's anything credible about allegations, supposedly because it's so painful to come forward and, you know, there, there's so much negative blowback, um, you know, that it's so traumatizing or so damaging when in fact it, it's useful to, to women's careers often. Yeah. You'd have to be crazy to believe that this Professor Tyson at Stanford University, who probably does know Christine Blasey Ford, because Blasey Ford also teaches at Stanford. Right, right. Remember, as so she teaches at both Palo Alto and Stanford, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes. They probably do know one another. They're both, you know, Democrats and active in the in the party and, and strong anti-Trump activists, etc. Yep. Yep. Um, it's thought that, that this won't actually benefit her career that she won't be invited to give talks about her experience and that people won't applaud her courage and her integrity you'd have to understand nothing about our current cultural moment to assume that there's anything you know that's going to be damaging to her as a result of her coming forward so you know the the um the incentives are just way too high and the disincentives essentially non-existent to making these kinds of allegations. And, and it can really never be disproved. You know, it, if some kind of right. sexual, any kind of sexual interaction happened, and we can never know for sure what happened in that hotel room. So, so she had, there's no risk to her whatsoever, and he'll never really be able to prove himself in it. Right. Pretty right. bad if you happen to be one of the people in the camp of, oh, what on earth does a woman possibly have to gain? I strongly suggest that you watch Janice's analysis of what happened in the Christine Blasey Ford affair. It went yeah. viral. It's got a yeah. couple of million views on it. As a matter of fact, I suggest we all put it uh, in the description area as we post this yeah, discussion. Uh, because I, if you haven't seen that, there is a lot to gain uh, politically. Uh, career-wise, uh, even academically, there's financially money to be made. Money. Um, money to be made. Yeah. Well, look yeah. at Anita. Look at Anita Hill. Who would know anything about Anita Hill? Look at the number of books she wrote based on her allegation against Clarence Thomas. Look at the number of awards she's received. The number of speaking engagements, for which she probably makes, you know, a very uh, high salary. Her whole career is based on that, and and she's. You know, adored, uh, adulated by by thousands and thousands of people as a result of that testimony. Yeah, and you know, I watched the the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings uh, without missing a minute of it, and I came away from that honestly with the impression that if every word she said was true, it still so didn't add up to a hill of beans. <laughs> yeah, There's, who left a pubic hair on that? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, yeah, for right. one thing, I, I absolutely did not believe that he said those things. At right. least I did not believe he, he said them in the, like, you have to understand the context. Maybe there might be a context, who knows, where people were joking and saying things where it would be understandable, but simply sort of out of the blue, you know, in a case where it wasn't in some way invited or condoned, I did not believe it happened in the way she said it did. But then as I agree with you. Even if it did, good God, really for that? He, you know, his whole distinguished career then means nothing. I, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, absolutely mind blowing. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Boy, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think we're, we all got on the same page and I was glad to see it uh, about our Lieutenant Governor here in Virginia. Um, I would have preferred somebody from a different political party with different politics uh, to be in that office. But I don't want to see any man leave office Absolutely over, not. over an accusation yeah. in yeah. a country where the presumption of innocence is supposed to be the rule of law. Yes. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to give him our award uh, for, um, 
uh, strong stance on behalf of justice and fairness. Uh, we give that to, to Justin Fairfax, whatever else he stands for. We might not necessarily agree with him, but uh, uh, but we admire him. I do admire him for standing up. It's it's uh, the temptation to simply disappear uh, and to give your big apology and step down must be overwhelming, especially when everybody around you is telling you that's exactly what you have to do. So, so good for him for that. Amen. Good for yep. him. Absolutely. And now <laughs> we have the flying Puta award. Oh, where is she? This time she goes to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez who was the winner of the humanitarian award last time there it goes right there the big uh, flying puta uh, it looks the like her 93 too. trillion dollar trick <laughs> <laughs> what can one. i say i mean uh, we could do probably 10 discussions on every outrageous objective lie goal yeah. bit of craziness in her agenda, and probably 10 more on how so many Democrats are sucking up to her, which I'm personally grateful for. Again, I think she's pushing the party into la la land. Yep, cartoons. By me. Cartoons. Indeed. Are we finished? I think we're finished. Oh, I have, I want to remind everybody, as I will be reminding them. This is not just an accidental t-shirt. Uh, Chicago, this August, mid-August, right. International Conference on Men's Issues, 2019. I believe there's three people in this discussion that will be there. I think that's right. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, and looking so forward to it. There will be links to get tickets below. And I want to personally extend an invitation. I, this, I love these events because they're a chance uh, not only to meet all the MRAs and other good people I, I've been able to work with over the years online, but to meet a lot of new people, shake a lot of hands, and really have a good time Yes, uh, socializing with people who don't happen to be crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which Could is the lot of fun. Couldn't have said it better. Such a great feeling in the room. It's yes. Really yes. positive, incredibly. And I mean, it was so funny when last year in London, when those two journalists came and reported about the bitterness and the anger, all these angry white men, you know, et cetera. And it's just so far from the <clears> truth. <throat> it's, so, it's so, such a positive, productive, constructive conversation. And it is such a relief, you know, not. Yeah, just not to be with crazy people. Yes. I agree. It is. So listen, right in the middle of the United States, flyover country, big city, lots of people will be able to make this one. I think the honey badgers are going to do a good job yes. uh, setting this up. I have a lot of confidence in that. Uh, so please show up and help make this thing a success. It's going to be fun. That's good. So are we out? We yeah. are over and out. Men are good. They are, indeed. See you guys next week. Well, we'll see you. some women that aren't that bad either. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. All right. We'll see you. Okay. All right. Take care. Take care.